The motion is, this House believes that West treats Russia unfairly. And I now look to my librarian, Krista Bilovich, Worcester College, to open the case for the proposition. Mr. President, honourable members and distinguished guests, what is fairness? Fairness encapsulates justice. Justice for the ordinary citizens in Russia, for the victims of aggression and expansionism in Russia, and for the many millions of citizens to which the West are directly accountable. Fairness is about efficacy. Even with the best of intentions, ineffective and counterproductive policies are unfair because they let those who are generally at fault get away with shifting their burdens to innocent, vulnerable persons. Above all, fairness is about a sense of normative appropriateness and proportionality. For my argument to be persuasive this evening, I must first ask something of you. I ask you to dispose of a presumption you likely held as you came into the chamber just 10 minutes ago. You must dispose of the presumption that on our side of the house, we will defend Russia's record and make apologetic, sweeping statements to substantiate that defence. And that on the opposing side, they will argue that Russia has been treated fairly as the sanctions imposed on and the rhetoric directed towards Russia is justified. Honourable members, dispose of this presumption and consider the possibility that the West policy towards Russia is too lenient. Too lenient in places where leniency hurts and yet unnecessarily destructive and punitive in others. This evening, the opposition must succeed in demonstrating not only that Russia is worth condemning and holding to account, something I irrefutably agree with, but that the West's current treatment is fair, that it is appropriate and neither too much nor too little. Honourable members and guests, that is exactly why the other side fails. I will begin by making three arguments this evening. Firstly, the West's Russian policies are counterproductive and lead to the unjust entrenchment of militaristic expansionist nationalism. The policies of the West are unfair towards the victims of Russian aggression and violence in territorial and regional skirmishes. Secondly, the West's sanctions are unfair towards the wider public of Russia, in that the economic impacts are least felt by the powerful oligarchs and politicians who control Russian politi po politics, but most earnestly felt by the innocent civilians in Russia. And thirdly, the West sanctions are unfair because they do not target sufficiently, if at all, the real culprits behind intentional acts of aggression. This is where a lot of the arguments from the opposition will sound very similar to my speech. But let's not be fooled by the powerful rhetoric from side opposition. They may convince you that Russia is an actor that must be curtailed. But to the extent that they fail to prove, to prove that the West currently treats Russia in an effective way that redresses its successes, its excesses. The many arguments that opposition will bring to you are only further reasons why side proposition must win this evening. But first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the opposition speakers for tonight's debate. Up first, we have Sir Malcolm Rifkin, a former Foreign and Defence Secretary serving under both Thatcher and uh, Major and former Chair of Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee from 2010 until 2015. Now, Sir Mal Malcolm is somewhat of a veteran when it comes to Oxford Union debate speaker speeches, having spoken twice here in the last four years. In both his speeches, Sir Malcolm began by stating that when it comes to his speech, he will follow the precedent set by Henry VIII, quoting something the King said to his wives, and I quote, Please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> so Malcolm, I will follow your tradition tonight by keeping this introduction so short. However, I hope given the inevitably persuasive arguments I will put forward tonight, the audience will not worry about my speech keeping them too long. The next speaker we will hear from is John Andrews. 
John is a senior editor for Project Syndicate and a contributing editor for The e Economist. Although John might be the only speaker on tonight's opposition bench without a knighthood, he is very well qualified <laughs> to speak on the no motion with, de <laughs> with decades of involvement with foreign policy issues. So I look forward to hearing what he has to say nonetheless. Our final opposition speaker is Sir Roderick Lynn a former diplomat who served as British ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2000 until 2014. On top of your extensive foreign policy experience, it is my understanding that you are a keen sportsman. Indeed, you're known for having raced against Alistair Campbell in a half marathon three, time, three times, so tonight's critique of Russia won't be the first time you've taken on a shadowy propaganda machine. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your speakers and they are most welcome. <laughs> Firstly, from the point of view of the victims of Russia, Russian expansionism and aggression, the West treats Russia unfairly because it fails to protect those who are most vulnerable. January 2016. Russia announced, in spite of ongoing sanctions, the formation and deployment of three motor rifle divisions and 60,000 soldiers along the Russian borders with the Baltic states. The Russian army regularly carries out simulated invasion and occupation of the Baltic states as part of their routine. February 10, 2017. Multiple Russian fighter jets buzz the US destroyer in the Black Sea marking one of the closest moments between the American and Russian militaries to active confrontation. February 14th, 2017, just over a week ago, it was found that Russia had violated treaties signed previously in times of the Cold War and fired off a set of SSCX-8 missiles without informing NATO. This was only the tip of an ever-enlarging iceberg of illicit missile tests happening right under our noses. Honourable members, I won't bore you with examples of Russian aggression and the failure of the West in liaising with the Russian threat, because I'm sure the opposition will give us far more examples of that in their speeches. What I want you to note, however, is that the West has not been and is not doing enough to address the ongoing crises. The truth of the matter is, sanctions have only made things worse. The sanctions designed to allegedly inhibit Russian military capacity, to exert so-called punitive deterrence on Russian elites, to reshape Russian policy, have all backfired. They have fed to the nationalistic narrative exploited by nationalistic officials and bureaucrats. Andrei Klimov, the deputy chair of the International Affairs Committee, Committee happily declared that, and I quote, it should be clear to everyone by now that the West cannot force Russia to do anything by applying illegal pressure of sanctions. It's not even worth discussing, he says. The mistake that the West has made about the Russian public is that its actions have only activated an anti-Western identity and sentiment amongst the members of the middle class they could otherwise have brought under the liberal flag. In March 2014, 56% of those surveyed by the Levada Center were very or somewhat concerned with Russia's isolation due to the Kremlin's policies towards the Kremlin, to Ukraine, sorry. Two years later, in August 2016, the number had dropped sharply, sharply to 40%. More than two thirds of Russians in August 2016 said that Russia, Russia ought to continue with its political course regardless of sanctions. Putin's approval rating remained at 80% throughout the two years of sanctions. This is in, dis in spite of our political leaders in the West complacently and eagerly celebrating the so-called successes of their strategies and tactics. More importantly, when the talk emerged in late 2016 that the West would consider exploring options other than san sanctions towards Russia, the primary shift in policy was towards one of appeasement, of granting further concessions to officials in the, at the Kremlin and loosening trade restrictions to uh, nationalist corporations. These moves only doubly 
strengthened the political capital of those who are steering a Russia entrenched in nationalism. This is unfair. This is obviously unfair. That we are incompetent, complacent and ineffective is unfair to those in the Baltics who live under the constant fear of being evaded and annexed by Russia. To those in the Ukraine who must face the threat of Crimean secessionists. To the millions of Russian citizens who are too fearful of their state to speak out against the invasive nationalism of the other half of their country. Unfair. Secondly, from the point of view of the wider Russian public, the West treats Russian unfairly because it puts unjustifiable costs on individuals who are not complicit in the aggression of their government. The ordinary citizen in Russia may have the ability to vote. They could also protest, engage in contentious politics and voice out their thoughts about their governments. But make no mistake, for whilst their nationalism could be used as a justification that legitimises their government's actions in the hands of political elites, the ordinary Russian voter has very little say over Russian aggression and expansionism. The upshot of this that I'd like you to know is the average Russian citizen should not bear the burden, the costs and the responsibility of the wars the Kremlin choose to fight outside Russia. Indeed, if you're a middle class family with a stable job and income, you, you probably weathered the sanctions quite well and came out with an ever positive conception of Putin as a strong and resilient leader. But this is not the same story that could be told by the elderly Russian citizens living in Sochi, who found their transportation subsidies and welfare cuts significantly in January 2016 due to extensive uh, austerity measures. Nor is, is it a vision that could be shared by the truck drivers in Western Siberia who had to face a hike in road tax in late 2015. Nor is it fair to the homeless living on the streets of Moscow finding their homeless shelters cut due to the reductions in government spending. Sure, they, aren't far, they by far aren't the majority of the Russian public. If anything, these individuals may not add up to 10% of the entire Russian population. But let us not forget that exploration and harming of the most vulnerable individuals in society is a universal moral wrong forced upon the Russian people. Sanctions have also harmed the most reliable allies the West could have within Russia. The Russian companies who have become most connected to the West via investment and trade links are led by pro-Western pro business leaders that have been pivotal in backing and supporting liberal legislators and politicians within Russia. These are the very same companies who are betrayed by Western leaders. In investment and businesses who redacted the many previously extant business deals and collaborative projects. These companies were left with no choice but to pivot away from Western partners but, and to Asia. No, thank you. Those who are unable to adapt and survive were forced to scale down substantially, leading to increased unemployment in their frontline workers and staff. Russia isn't a homogenous entity, and neither are the Russian people. We are being fair, unfair here in that we are failing to target the root of the problem and instead exploiting the suffering of vulnerable groups to satisfy our own, uh, to satisfy our own appetite for political complacency. In that we are walking away from some of our closest economic partners within the Russian economy and leaving them to the ever encroaching conglomerates of nationalistic firms. Unfair. My final point, honourable members and guests, is that the West is being unfair to the course of global justice in the way that we treat Russia. From the point of view of the global community, we have failed our mission as the West to support and uphold an order of peace, equality and freedom. Since the Crimean annexation in 2014, the West have introduced a series of fundamentally ineffectual gestures designed to deceive the general public into thinking that the West has a comprehensive game plan in dealing with Russian expansionism. Let's make no mistakes here. The West sanctions have targeted predominantly 
the private sector, and even then, companies whose revenue would never have gone to the Kremlin in the first place. Putin's personal income and wealth increased substantially in spite of these sanctions, because none of his investment portfolios were even dented to the slightest by sanctions. Contrast this against the severe losses incurred by European farmers due to the complete shutdown of Russian markets. The counter, no thank you, the counter sanctions adopted by Russia have led to the loss of 5.5 billion euros of agricultural food exports amongst the leading agricultural exporters within the EU. The Austra Aust Austrian Institute for Economic Research suggested that over 2 million jobs within the EU could be lost as a result of impudently and unnecessarily imposed sanctions upon Russia and the resultant retaliation adopted by Russia. Opposition may try and tell you that the West is being fair to Russia, that the issue is not one of fairness, but of whether we are doing enough to resolve the problems today. But this is untrue. The way we are treating Russia is apparently unfair. It ignores the fact that where there are spillover costs and harms to people that we have been too eager as the Western establishment to throw under the bus. It ignores the fact that our current actions are not only ineffective, they have been designed and planned in structurally flawed ways, such that they could never target those who ought to be held accountable for their wrongs. The 298 lives lost in the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17. The 350 people killed in the Azerbaijan-Armenian conflict, instigated by Russia. The thousands of people living under the constant fear of Russian aggression. Whilst we sit in this chamber, tucked safely away in the UK, these are people that must bear the brunt of our poorly shaped Russian policy, a perverse course of action designed to enrich and empower perpetrators of injustice is beyond not enough. It is actively unjust. A foreign policy program designed to satisfy our moral righteousness but answer no actual real life questions is more than not good enough. It is damningly unjust. A lie told a million times over and over again does not become true. And even if it were to somehow become true that the West is treating Russia somewhat unfairly, I could not be prouder than I am today to stand and propose this motion. Thank you.